everyone, and welcome to today's live broadcast. Size Matters, Accurate Detection and Phasing of Structural Variations, presented by Fritz Sieblicek, PhD Lead Scientific Programmer, Baylor College of Medicine. I am Kaylee Bach of LabRoots, and I will be your moderator for today's event. We are delighted to bring you this educational web seminar presented by LabRoots. LabRoots is the leading scientific social networking website and producer of educational virtual events and webinars. Before we begin, I would like to remind everyone that this event is interactive. We encourage you to participate by submitting as many questions as you want at any time you want during the presentation. Just click on the Ask a Question box located on the far left of your screen and type your questions into the drop-down box and click Send. We'll answer as many of your questions as we have time for at the end of the presentation. If you have trouble seeing or hearing the presentation, please click on the Help Desk button located in the promotional board at the bottom center of your screen, or use the Ask a Question box to let us know that you're having a problem. This presentation is educational and thus offers continuing education credits. Please click on the Continuing Education Credits tab located on the top right corner of the presentation window and follow the process to obtain your credits. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Sibbicek. We will now turn the presentation over to him. Welcome, everyone. Uh, thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to present my work. Um, before we dive into the matter, I figured I should just give you a brief overview of my and my group's scientific interests. So my group is mainly, inter uh, mainly uh, interested in developing algorithms for mapping and assembling short and long reads, but also very much in detection of variants, such as structure variants. Overall, we are leveraging our knowledge that we obtained over benchmarking studies to determine which signals are true or, or false. And I'm very happy and fortunate to collaborate with many people to study human, model organisms, or also non-model organisms across the globe. Um, but our topic today is about structure variants. So our understanding about structure variants is really driven by technologies, being it late in 1940s to 1980s, where we could identify losses or gains of chromosome arms or carrier typing until near early 2000s, where we had uh, microarrays at our hand, where we could detect copy number variations of certain genes. But really, just from, with the start of 2008, 2009, the advance of short read sequencing, such as Illumina, we get more and more um, knowledge about those structural variants and their frequency. And today, I will argue that single molecule sequencing, such as the bug biosystem, but also the nanopore system, really broaden our understanding of structural variants in the human genomes and also other organisms. Structural variants are generally very important in, among different aspects of medicine and biology, being it an evolutionary context where we can, for example, speak about gene gains and gene losses, genomic disorders such as Mendelian diseases, or just recently as cancer, where we're currently uh, writing up a publication in SKBR3, where we investigate the genomic disorders and therefore the amplification of certain oncogenes. Being the impact of structural variants on regulatory units, we're unfortunate to work together with the GTEx and ENCODE consortium and as well as, of course, phenotypic changes um, that are also um, influenced by structure variants, as, a, as I showed on a recent publication in the beginning of 2017. But giving a, going a step back, how do we actually detect structure variants? So this is basically just a very um, naive view here across the five types of structure variants that we observe, being it deletions, insertions, uh, tendon duplications, inversions, and translocations. And we often can detect those over per end distance or per end reads, such as from the Illumina machine, where we observe abnormal distances or abnormal orientation of the two pairs. Furthermore, we can leverage uh, split read signals. Split reads are when two regions or more of the same read are mapped to different regions of the chromosome. And by that, we can pretty much nail down uh, where the breakpoints are and which kind of type or which type of structure runs we observe. However, today we are going to focus on this long read technology such as BugBio and Nanopore, and I'm going to show you why. So they have different advantages, such as we can observe structural variants in repetitive regions where it's generally very hard to map those short reads into. They can span the structural variants, meaning we can follow the continuous sequence of, of the read through a structural variant rather than observing kind of a pattern over the pair end reads. Uh, they have more uniform coverage, less bias in GC regions, for example. And as I'm going to show you today, we can identify even more complex structural variants in the four or five types that I showed you in the previous slide. 
However, we have to cope with two challenges. First of all, they have a much higher sequencing error rate than Illumina, and their length plus their sequencing error rate makes them really hard to align. So the centralized question today is really can how can we fully leverage these technologies? And here I'm going to talk about first improving of, of the alignment of those reads, then improvement of our structure vision calling, which is the program sniffles. I'm going to show you some evaluation and results that we have on real data. And in the end, I'm going to talk about how can we extend this um, work and leverage these technologies also for larger cohorts, giving them more expensive technologies. So the first point I'm always asked before developing uh, new methods and new algorithms is do we actually need them? So always the first question is why another mapper we have already so many short reads and quite a few long read mappers. So here I'm showing you an IGV screenshot of BWMM. BWMM is among one of the few standard mappers for long reads. And what we can see here is basically we have um, different um, reads plotted in uh, this gray lines and we see a lot of noise going on. So we see a lot of colors. So every color represents, for example, for example substitutions. We see purple color, which is insertions. And we see these uh, black lines, which are actually short deletions. And we kind of wonder what is, what is going on in this region for real. When we, do, when we map the same reads with our new method, NGMLR, we basically see that we can replace this noisy pattern with a kind of very comprehensive looking uh, deletion, uh, which is homozygous. And we can see that by these black lines going through the image here with the predicted length. Let's do another example, for example, this one. Again, we see with BWMM, we see, get a very noisy pattern in terms of colors. We see a lot of mismatches. We see, again, these little um, lines popping up, which indicate deletions. So maybe it's the same type as, as previously. But actually, when we map the same reads and actually with a lower runtime, we see that the middle block is actually inverted. So this would be an inversion instead of a deletion in the previous slide. And really, so we focused on, on NGMLR basically on improving two parts. First of all, the split reads to enhance the mapping across translocations, inversions, and duplications. And then also improve the alignment itself, which should enable us to better map out insertions and deletions. And a lot of this work is really done by Philip Rationator, who was a former colleague of mine back in Vienna. So I want to dive in shortly how we do that. So for the split reads, we do the following schematic um, pipeline. So we have a long read. We split them up in 256 base pairs. Just for sake of an example, we assume that the orange part is a difficult to map region. Maybe it's a repetitive region or a very high noise ratio from errors. Then we use uh, the short read mapper NGM that, I, that we developed over my PhD back in Vienna to map all of this subsequence uh, to the reference genome. Next, we make a catalog of where these subsegments are mapping these 256 base per subsegments. And we see, for example, that the blue arrow is mapping at uh, location 1,500 with a alignment score of 99. We see that the orange part, which is a little bit more tricky, is mapping to multiple locations, but not very well given the indication of the alignment score. So therefore, this, uh, this part is ignored. For the gray part, we see that it's mapping on two places very well, but on one place, it's kind of sh um, shady. So therefore, the third place is ignored, so on and so forth. So next, we want to reconcile these things. So here, we just show the plot of the read as we observed it on the y-axis versus the location of the subsegments of the 256 base pairs on the x-axis on the chronometer reference genome. So the first thing that, that we observe quite clearly is which parts of the reads are next to each other on the read as well as on the reference genome. And here, this is, for example, the gray and the green arrow. And therefore, we can group those things together and build one segment. The next part is we can see that the blue and the gray arrow is actually equally distant on the read and on the reference due to the missing of a good mapping of the orange part. So we can, again, reconcile these things. So next is getting a little bit more challenging because now we have to distinguish if we trust the orange error, or if we trust those three errors on the red side. And for that, we compute uh, the pairwise distances of those alignments. And based on the alignment score and the information how they are aligning together with a dynamic programming approach, we can reconcile that, that this, for example, is the correct answer to where this read is mapping to and how this read is mapping. And by that, we see that the green error here actually indicates a small inversion. 
So now we are good with, with brick reads, but how do we improve the alignment itself? Uh, that was the first case where BWMM showed us a very noisy alignment with the deletion, for example. So doing a pairwise alignment between sequences have basically more or less like three different modes. First of all, it's the linear Swiss Waterman or Needleman Wunsch that almost all of us learned during college in computer science. The thin gap cost model accounts for an opening versus an extension of a gap, and therefore reflects better the biological signal, and therefore is used by most of the mappers right now. What we propose is the convex gap cost, and I'm going to show you why this is. So for the thin gap cost, since we have this long reads, we have to take into account that we have single base pair insertion and deletion sequencing errors, and quite a couple of those. So for this given example that I'm showing here, we basically end up with two equally likely scenarios from the thin gap cost model, being the upper one where we have like one, two, three, four, five, six and single insertions and deletions, and maybe one deletion in the read itself in the lower track. The other alignment proposes that we have one, two, three larger events and just fewer sequencing errors. So given the knowledge that this that the dominant sequencing error from the machines are single insertion and deletions, we know that the upper alignment is more likely. And here is where it comes, where it comes the convex gap cost into play. So the convex gap cost basically assigns different scoring schemes depending on the length of the observed um, event. And by that, we, we can finally achieve that automatically the upper alignment is chosen because it has a higher alignment score. So now that we proved or improve the split read mapping as well as the pairwise mapping on its own, I can show you some of the simulations and evaluation how these things improve things. So for that, we simulated using Survivor, which is a tool that I developed, 20 structure variants of different types and different size regimes. Um, today, I'm just going to show you the results of the bug bio simulated reads, and we evaluated uh, mappers such as Blazor, BWMM, CraftMap, and NGMLR. Basically, the evaluation is based on this little screenshot on the right, where, for example, a deletion, if it's mapped out correctly by each of the read, meaning corresponding breakpoints, so there's no noise in the middle, then we call this read correctly mapped. We call a read wrongly mapped if there is a noise pattern or different matches across the deletion, because this is not indicating the deletion at all. And we call a read indicated, so yellow, if the breakpoints are a little bit fuzzy, but overall we can make out that there is a deletion in between. So here are different bar plots. On the, on the x-axis, you see the size regimes of the structure variance. And again, we simulated 20 structure variance per bar. And on the y-axis, you see the percentage of reads. So red means that the read were basically aligned through. Here, the insertions and deletions. Yellow means the indicated part. Uh, gray means uh, if the, just part of the read was aligned, but not continuously through the uh, insertion or deletion. And white means that the reads were not aligned. So overall, we see that NGMLR really improves um, our ability to map those reads across insertion deletions. And this is mainly because of this convex gap cost function. For other types of variants, we still see an improvement across multiple types and multiple size regimes compared to other mappers only in the case with a very um, small base pairs of translocations. So here, for example, 100 base pair translocations, we see that we cannot precisely map those out. But in reality, we don't, don't expect to observe this kind of type of event very often. So the next part of my presentation is diving into the structure variants. So now we have this enhanced mapper. We, of course, want to leverage a better signal to map out structure variants. However, again, I want to um, show you why we actually need another structure variation column. So first of all, we want, of course, to leverage these data sets and this mapping for all types of structure variants, so deletions, tandem duplications, insertions, inversion, translocations. We also needed a better method to cope with still artifacts of sequencing errors or PCR. And the structure variation column that I'm presenting here, Sniffles, is really also able to detect more complex types of variation. So for example, here I'm showing you on the right an inverted tandem duplication where a molecule goes from right to left, jumps back a little bit, and continues towards the right. And we can see that this, is, this can be nicely mapped out of sh with long reads. However, in the short read track, which is in the lower bottom, we see that the uh, paired ends are, spliced, are, are split uh, with larger fragments, but we don't see the overall signal of this structure. End. 
And these types of structural events are still important because they are associated with different diseases, for example, the MACP2 and the PARR2. And we have also more complex other events that I'm going to show you that are also associated with different disease phenotypes. So I'm very brief what does this will do. Um, it basically analyzes the split reads, the alignment events, as well as the noisy regions. So with noisy regions, we mean signals such as we saw from BWM in the first few first slides. Um, it does a parameter estimation to adopt itself automatically to pack biodata as well as nanopore data. Um, it can detect sequencing artifacts and therefore counteracts it. Optional, it provides a genotyping estimation and a clustering or phasing of structural variants if they are close together. So again, I'm using the same simulated results. Um, this time we are benchmarking against different structural variation colors. So survivor is basically a consensus color which uses Lumpy, Delhi, and Mantis, a free short reads color based colors that are that are run for this data sets. Uh, BB Honey was previously used uh, based on blazer alignments uh, across the bug bio reads, and then we have sniffles with BWMM and sniffles with our mapper and GMLR. And we see that sniffles compared to the other mappers already enhance our ability to detect indoors correctly. So precise here really means that the breakpoint has to be within plus minus 10 base pairs to be called as precise. Otherwise, it will be indicated, which allows up to a 1 kb distance of the simulated breakpoint. But also for other types, such as duplications, translocations, and inversions, we see that sniffles really improve the ability to call these events, um, even just based on BWM. Only in the scenario where we have a 100 base pair tandem duplication, we have a yellow bar. And this is because that this duplication is actually called as an insertion. And with this slide, I'm just recapitulating that a duplication actually means that the same sequence is inserted next to each other. Therefore, I would argue that the 100 base pair insertion call here is not too bad. More interestingly are the more complex type of events. For example, the inversion flanked by deletions or the uh, tandem, uh, inverted tandem duplication that I showed you previously. So here's again an IGV screenshot how an inversion flanked with two deletion looks like. So the middle segment here is an inverted segment flanked by two heterozygous deletions here and here. All these three events can be precisely called with NGMLR and sniffles. However, um, other callers lack the ability to identify the whole complexity of this region. We see by the paired end, this, by the short read paired ends, that the inversion is supported but we don't have a, and don't have enough signal to detect those deletions that are flanking it. And again, this inversion uh, flanked by deletion is a variant type that was associated with a blood cloaking disorder in 2007. Furthermore, the inverted tandem duplication, as I showed you before, is also now a, we are now also able to detect this uh, on a high precision using NGMLR together with sniffles, which wasn't been able to be to be detected previously. So next, I want to dive into some real results, uh, some real data results and evaluation for those two methods. So again, we are using Survivor, and um, this time not just on the short read data, but also comparing uh, different structural variation calls like Monkey within a sample. So Survivor is really just a general toolkit was, that allows us to simulate and evaluate structural variations and structural variation callers. It allows the comparison, the merging of multiple structural variation call sets, being it within the samples or across the samples. And it also has uh, several other tools, for example, to summarize uh, what structural variants were called or what size regimes were called. So the first example that I want to dive into is obviously a trio where we can leverage uh, the Mendelian um, inheritance. Um, here we got data from call zero, which is actually the reference of our adopsis. CVI zero is a very distant uh, cultivar from our adopsis compared to the reference. And then we also sequence the F1 um, cross of both parents. And you can see we, we have quite prestigious coverage for all three data sets, as these data sets were taken from the Falkland on SIP paper. So the first question is, of course, which structural variants are homozygously found in the call zero, but are not found in the F1 generation, which would indicate an error in the calling. So overall, we identified 57 uh, structural variants being homozygous in the call zero. The number is so low because that's, again, what I said is the reference genome, actually, the reference cultivar of our adopsis. So initially, using sniffles and NGMLR, we missed four structural variants out of this 57. 
And these were two different reasons. So first of all, we had an insertion and deletion that were called as a 53 base pair event in the call zero, but then we are inferred as a 47 base pair event and 48 base pair event in the F1. And the cutoff for the length uh, by default in sniffles was 50 base pairs. But we could re-identify them once we lowered the size threshold. And then we had another case, two other cases, where we had a deletion and tandem duplication that were also only supported by four reads in this region. Um, when we lowered, again, the coverage threshold that Sniffles uses by default, we were able to identify them. So overall, we could identify all the uh, structure variants that were homozygously detected in call zero in the F1 successfully. A more tricky scenario is the CVI. The CVI is a very distant um, cultivar to the reference gene of our dropsis. Therefore, we found over 10,000 structure variants to be homozygous in this variety. Initially, we missed 370, which means a missing rate of 3.62%, false negative rate of 3.62%. And this had also, again, different reason, region, uh, reasons like in the previous slide. So first of all, we identified almost 160 of those events had to low read support. So when lowering the threshold, we could identify it easily. 101 events had actually a size threshold problem like previously shown, low, slightly below 50 base pairs. 43 of those um, events were indicated by different size or by different types. For example, when transposons are called, this can be an insertion of a transposon or it can be represented as a, as a uh, reinsertion, as a movement of, a, of the transposon into a different region but we could resolve that by lowering the type constraint. And then we also took the call zero, the CVI, uh, the NOVA assembly that we got from Falcon and SIP and investigated those closers. And we indeed find 50 regions where we missed structure variants, um, where it seems to that the F1 doesn't have the corresponding region of the CVI present in its genome. So we ended up with only 17, 17 structure variants that we could not re-identify in the F1 cross, which is a success rate of 99.8%. So next, I'm going to dive into some human data. Uh, we used the any one 278 because it's like the gold standard in genomics. It's a healthy female. And the very interesting aspect here was it was sequenced with many technologies, um, giving from Illumina, PacBio, as well as Oxford Nanopore. So initial, this is the table just showing the initial call set. Um, we had varying coverage between those different technologies. So 55x for BugBio, but only 28x for Oxford Nanopore, and 50x coverage for Illumina. And also what I have to say is, as well is that the BugBio data set is, is um, a little bit older than the other data sets. So the first thing that was interesting to see is actually that for Oxford Nanopore, we almost observed 27,000 deletions which seems a little bit high. So we dived into this data and looked at some examples. And here's one of those screenshots. So in the lower track, you see the Oxford Nanopore data. In the middle track, the bug bio data. And in the upper track, the Illumina reads, how they're mapping to. And we see here that we observe like three deletions in this short region based on the Oxford Nanopore data. And we see that neither bug bio nor Illumina support any of those deletions, which is kind of suspicious. Um, what we also saw is that all three of those deletions happen actually in low complexity region, which indicated to us that this is probably a base calling artifact from Oxford Nanopore. And that was also uh, suggested by a recent publication that came out recently over this Oxford Nanopore data. And Oxford Nanopore is indeed working on this problem and almost resolved it up to now. Um, in the meantime, we also sequenced the same sample here at the Baylor College of Medicine. Uh, up to 34x coverage. And we see that the deletion counts really reduced from 27,000 to 7,000, much more in line from what we see from the bug bio data sets. Um, overall, we were very interested in the performance of the insertions and deletions, especially because we had very problems um, calling insertions over the Illumina data with this data sets. Um, and also had a big discrepancy frequency between the Illumina data sets and the long read data sets in terms of numbers of events. Here's, for example, one region where Nanopore and BugBio agrees on a deletion. Uh, we see a drop in coverage of indicating a deletion in Illumina. However, this, this side was not picked up by any of our short read 
uh, structural vision colors that we applied here, which was meant that Dali and Lumpy free of the most commonly used structural vision colors, I think, for short read data. So what we what we did um, to approach this and to to ask a question, how can we assess if a event that was a long read was really supported in the short reads or not, was the following kind of straightforward idea. So given that we have paired entries for the short reads, um, can, we can estimate or we can measure the average insert size of these paired ends, which in this case was around 311 base pairs. If there is a deletion event happening, this distance between the two pairs is significantly in reach, uh, enlarged. If there is an insertion happening and then two pairs are moving closer together until the second pair, for example, is inside of the insertion, therefore not met. So by using this, um, we used a two-sided t-test to assess this uh, given cause from the short, long read data over the paired end distance in the short read data and assess deletions from 50 base pair to 3 kb size regime and insertions from 50 base pair to 300 base pair. The 300 base pair was due to that if the insertion were longer than 300 base pair, the second pair wouldn't have been mapped. And here are the results. Um, for this, we used a p-value of 0 0.01 or smaller to call something significant. Interestingly, um, given the initial cause from BugBio or Oxford Nanopore with Sniffles and NGMLR, we were able to identify much more significant deletions than with the actual Illumina cause on the O. And when comparing um, the BugBio and the Nanopore data set, we identified that 84% of deletions uh, were on agreement as well as 46% or 47% of the insertions or for the coverage levels were almost halved for nanopore compared to bug bio. The last chapter I want to touch base on this any 1278 cause set was the translocations or BND cause. Translocations are again indications that uh, a molecule spans from one chromosome to another chromosome. And this is very important for example, cancer studies. So, out of, so Illumina, all three callers agreed that we had 2,247 translocation calls, whereas in BugBio, for example, we just found 120. And I want to show you one of those regions that really represented lots of those scenarios. So we see here the Illumina data. We see multiple reads colored here that are indicating translocation. So the second pair of those reads are mapped to a different chromosome. However, when we pull in the bug bio, the Oxford nanobot data, we see in both data sets independently that there is an insertion event going on in a low complexity region, which actually highlights a repeat expansion rather than a translocation. When we look back in the Illumina data, we actually see, I hope you can see that, that the reads are truncated, indicated by this red stripe in the end, and therefore also more pointing towards an insertion event rather than a translocation event, because if there would be a translocation event, the reads would be split and the second part of the read would be aligned on a different chromosome. So by characterizing this, uh, we can of course quantify how often these events happen. And actually out of this 2,247 translocation events, 53% of them are just this scenario where we observe a repeat expansion rather than a translocation. Overall, we had multiple uh, scenarios where we had different types called, but this insertion uh, artifact seems to be really the dominant cause of this false cause in the short read data. Of course, this is not just happening for translocation events, but we also observed a similar scenario for inversions, but with lower frequency. So here again, for the inversions, I'm showing you the reads colored in blue and two keys um, that indicate the inversion events. So this pair of that reads are mapped to a different location with a different orientation. And again, in this low complexity scenario, we see an insertion happening indicated by the bug bio and from the actual nanopod data independently. So all of these tools and all of these technologies are working pretty nicely right now. Still, uh, we have the problem that these technologies are rather pricey compared to the uh, short read data. So therefore, we are currently working on, on the question, like how can we apply this long read data in a cost-effective cost effective manner um, in larger cohorts? And for that, we are looking at the CCDG data, uh, where multiple sequencing centers, including ours, sequence up to 20,600 individuals whole genome sequence. 
And we really need those studies because we want to identify what are common or rare structural variants in the population, and by that indicating, um, for example, the risk of a pathogenic um, variant. Uh, we want to have this structural variant called catalogs across different ethnicities and different phenotypes to inform Chiba studies. Of course, also the ethnicity-specific structural variation catalog is something that would be very nice to achieve. And also we're very interested in, of course, uh, the variability of certain regions that for medical relevance, such as the MHC and LPA region on chromosome 6. And on the lower track, I'm showing you a density plot across chromosome 6, the plot that they are leaf frequency on the y-axis, and the position across chromosome 6 on the x-axis. And we see hot, common hotspots, such as the MHC, where we have multiple alleles that are shared among individuals. Uh, what, is, what was also interesting to see was that on the inside of the chromosome, so in the middle region of the chromosome, we also had multiple alleles with shared um, structural variants across the population, which indicates that not just MHC might be very tricky, it might be very highly variable, but also um, other regions along chromosome 6 and also across the whole genome. However, with the short read data, um, it is often reported that we are lacking sensitivity so missing a lot of structural variants, as indicated by the tables that I showed you today. But also, we have the problem of false positives, so meaning falsely called structural variants, as I just gave you the example for these repeat extensions versus translocations or inversions. So therefore, we are working on a strategy on how to select subsamples out of this large cohort to be sequenced as long reads to not just validate those structural variant counts if we are those structural variant calls that we observed over the short read data, but further inform structure across structural variants that we maybe have missed. And by that, we, I've implemented a framework on kind of a greedy selection of samples. And the cool thing here is that we can choose samples very efficiently and therefore be also very price efficient. So basically what, what I did here is I took um, from this 20,600 samples, I took out 4,400 samples where we have actually sampled DNA data um, at, at the HTSC. And then I ask the question, how can I select those samples, uh, giving the initial structuration calls to obtain the most from our for the money spent. And the important curve is on the lower left, whereas the fraction of the structure when is captured, so this is calculated back to the overall population of the 4,400, and the number of samples that we select. So this is up to 100. And the interesting thing is that if you are selecting 100 samples, so this is 3%, around 3% of the samples of this whole sub-cohort, we can validate 50% of the structure variance in this data set. So this is a very efficient way to validate a large number of structure variants. Another interesting fact is that this framework automatically selected uh, the most number of samples to be from African American, followed by Hispanic, and then Caucasians but also doesn't require the ethnicity information. So it also selected five samples where we lack the ethnicity information in this cohort. So it's an uninformed way um, of selecting samples and, and giving them, getting them best, the most of it for in terms of validation. And what we are currently doing with it is, is we're hunting for this comprehensive genomes um, with, with this following pipeline. By using NGMLR and SNFOS, we detect structure variants over Oxford Nanopore or ArcBio. And then we are using 10x genomics um, by using the long ranger pipeline to phase the structure variants together with the SNPs that we have already called in the CCDG cohort. And this phasing together is done over the HAPCAT2 pipeline. And then this merged structure variants from the long reads with the linked reads together with the phased SNP information from HAPCAT2 is put together into cross-stitch. Cross-stitch is a program that is currently um, implemented with, uh, by the Shatz lab at the Johns Hopkins University. And by that, we obtain a haplotype resolved SNPs and structure version list and can also re-identify uh, re the whole genome as a, file, as a diploid faster file. And then we are working on how to reintroduce a geno computational genotype to SNPs and structure variants in the larger cohort of CCDG. And we already did that for four samples right now, and we are processing right now this 100 samples that we selected by the framework that I presented in the previous slide. And I'm just going to show you some very brief results that we obtained. 
So first result here is based on phasing of SNPs and structure bands together, again on chromosome 6. Chromosome 6 is very interesting to us because it contains MHC and LPA. So for the Ashkenazi sun that we run here, we obtained a mo DNA molecule length for the 10x genomics, which is almost 100 kb. So this is really an optimal scenario. Using BugBio, we obtained a 0 0.2 megabytes and 50 phasing um, scaffold. With the 10x genomics long range of pipeline, this was improved by up to 8 MB due to the better DNA, uh, the longer DNA quality. However, with our pipeline and with our optimized parameters, we actually can pumped it up to 67 MP and, phase, and 50 phasing length. And what this brings you is basically two phasing blocks per chromosome up on chromosome arm on chromosome 6, phasing completely through MHC and as well as LPA. However, in a different data set, HS1011, uh, we had not that prestigious DNA quality, and therefore the N50 phasing uh, of course, dropped significantly. We were just able to get barely 1 MB and 50 phasing blocks. We are still able to phase some regions in MHC and other regions is still informative, but it's not as prestigious as we got from the different, uh, as for the different sample. And this also indicates the variability in the, and the necessity for these phasing approaches, um, giving a prestigious DNA quality. So one of the last slides that I want to show you is a deletion actually that we identified over the bug bio data sets, and we also have RNA-seq data sets um, for those samples. The interesting part of this deletion is, first of all, it's in intergenic space. Second of all, it was not identified by tenex genomics. So we see that HS1011 has a heterozygous deletion indicated with this red bar here. Um, for anyone to inseminate the healthy female, we observe a homozygous deletion. Interestingly, when we look at the RNA-seq expression of HLA-F, the expression FBKM also almost drops to a third between those two samples. Um, furthermore, if we look at the NA24385, which is the Ashkenazi sun again, we observe again a homozygous deletion here and a comparable, comparable expression value to any one to eight for the same gene, which kind of slightly indicates that maybe this deletion has something to do with the expression of the HLAF gene but also with the usage of the exons. And we're currently investigating this further because just on those three samples, it's very hard to conclude something. So to wrap things up, to wrap things up, the methods that I introduced to the day to was NGMLR, which is a long read mapper. Uh, the manuscript is currently out in bioarchive and the software is freely available on GitHub. Sniffles, which is our structural relation detection tool for long reads. Uh, can also detect nested structure events, for example, the inversion with the deletions or the inverted tandem duplication. Uh, the manuscript is together with NextGemMap LR and BioArchive. Um, NextGemMap, the short read mapper that we developed over my PhD, um, which was published in 2013 by Informatics and is kind of heavily used. It's, a, it's available on GitHub as well for free. And Survival was the toolkit that we used for simulating those structure events, evaluating structure relation call sets and comparing and merging structure events within samples and across samples, and was published in 2017 in Nature Communications. It's also freely available on my GitHub site. So in the end, I want to acknowledge um, the Human Genome Sequencing Center here at Beta College of Medicine, especially my colleagues Will, Stephen Richards, and Richard Gibbs, obviously, uh, John Hopkins, my former PI, Michael Schatz, and the whole Schatz lab for their continuous help and collaborations. Um, Back in my PhD lab from the University of Vienna, Philip Rationator, with whom um, I did the study uh, with the long read mapping and the structure version caller. Mort Smock also helped a lot, a lot with the coding, and Anne from Heslo, who is the PI, and of course, NIH for uh, generosity funding. Thank you much. Thank you, Dr. Sulecek, for that informative presentation. We will now start the live Q&A portion of the webinar. If you have a question you'd like to ask, please do so now. Just click on the Ask a Question drop-down box located on the far left of your presentation window. Type in your question into the box that appears on your screen and click the Send button. We'll answer as many of your questions as we have time for. Let's get started. Our first question is, how much coverage do you recommend for the long read sequencing? Um, this is indeed a very good question because like, it's about price and costs per study. Um, I prepared an extra slide for that. So here we basically 
took the NE1 to its 7 8, which was 55x original coverage, and subsampled it to 5x, 10x, 15x, 20x, and 40x. Uh, we ran then our methods NGMLR and Sniffles with different pr coverage parameters indicated in different colors. And when you fix um, the to have an 80% recall, uh, which is on the y-axis, um, you can actually get up to 85% uh, of precision indicated by 10, 15x coverage. And also when we look at SKBF free, a data set that I haven't presented yet, um, which is a breast cancer cell line data set, when we fix again the 80% precision, we can obtain a slightly less than 80% recall over 15x coverage, and, I've, and so these two data sets represent that 10x to 15x really is kind of the sweet spot. I wouldn't go below that because that would mean that you have five reads or less per haplotype, and also since the coverage is a Poisson model basically also for these long reads, you end up having the risk of multiple regions having no coverage at all. Okay, our next question is these long range technologies are known to have high error rates. Is this a problem for applications like SNP calling, et cetera? Right, that's an interesting question. So yes, um, but bio as well as nanopore has a higher se sequencing error rates of 10% or even above that. Um, the good thing though is that the sequencing error themselves are randomly distributed, which means with 5X coverage or 10X coverage, we often can obtain a higher accuracy in terms of SNP calling. Um, of course, with higher coverage levels than that, the accuracy in SNP calling is even higher. And we are currently preparing a manuscript uh, for a new SNP caller um, that can leverage these long read technologies. And that's, this will thread into an effort to get this comprehensive genomes just by over long reads, because then we will be able to not just call structure variants and accurately map those reads, but also call SNP nucleotide variants. Thank you. Another question we have here asks, where do you see the application of these long reads for clinical applications? Um, right. I mean, right now we have, we, have the, we have the trend of having this short read technologies into clinics, um, especially over exon sequencing, which is very inexpensive. And since they have low sequencing error rates, the precision of SNP calls in this exon region is also very interesting. Um, overall, I think, we will see that I think capture assays will make it the first will make the first wave into these clinics, which shows an inexpensive and fast way to obtain these long reads in certain targeted genes regions um, to identify structure variants and SNPs of hard to assess region. Uh, we are just having a preprint up for GPA uh, for Parkinson's disease, uh, where we used a, a 9KB capture array uh, using nanopore to identify SNPs and structure variants for this disease in a certain region where it's generally hard to assess variability uh, with the Illumina data. And we could validate um, all the SNP calls and all the structure variant calls um, by previously known literature um, that we obtained over these data sets and just had one false discovered SNP pair sample. Okay, we have time for one more question. And this one says, comprehensive genomes are great. How far along are methods to leverage these informations? Right, so as I presented today, um, basically what you obtain out is a diploid phase genome, a diploid sequence. Um, so not just one faster, faster file, but two. Um, unfortunately, there are not many methods right now that can leverage this uh, information. Um, I know that for, for example, STAR, which is an RNA-seq, uh, liner um, is modified towards that it can leverage um, both haplotype information to map this RNA-seq data. The challenge here is if you have this uh, haplotype resolved data, is that each region is represented basically twice because you have two haplotypes. And therefore, the concept of mapping qualities um, is not any more true because like mapping qualities represent if a read can be mapped uniquely or not in the whole genome. Um, so this needs further computational and algorithmic development to really cope with these challenges in the new future. I would like to once again thank Dr. Sudlicek for his presentation. I would also like to thank LabRoots for making today's educational webcast possible.
Before we go, I want to let everyone know that today's webcast will be available for an on-demand viewing through August of 2018. You will receive an email from LabRoots letting you know when this webcast will be available for replay. Please share that announcement with your colleagues who may have missed today's live event. That's all for now. Thank you for joining us. We hope to see you again soon. Goodbye.